Hi, my name's Nick Fraser, and here we are, early March, in the gardens at Nunnington Hall. I've been gardening here at Nunnington Hall for 21 years, originally as the assistant gardener, now I'm the head gardener. But prior to that, I've been working in horticulture since I left school at 15 years old. My first job was 16 years old and I worked with the British Rail Horticultural Department. I've done many other gardening jobs in between them and I have a real love of nature and wildlife and I'm a keen member of our local Natural History Society and everything we do in the garden is centred around what we can get, what we can do for the wildlife and what benefits we can bring to biodiversity. So the National Trust were left Nunnington Hall by the Fife's. It was bequeathed to us in the, in the 1950s. However, some of the family members stayed on here until late 1970s when the Trust finally took over and then after that we opened it as a visitor attraction that you see today. So here we are walking along the south front of the house. It's a real sun trap, so people love these benches in the summer as the sun's reflecting onto the south face aspect of the house and really capturing the sun. We have a long line of tulips which flower at the beginning of the year along here and it's underplanted with an apita which continues that seasonal colour throughout the rest of the season. So the original layout that we see at Nunnington Hall dates back from the 17th century. The original topography of the land and, and the walls, um, it has gone through several changes over the time. But the period we're most interested in is the 1920s when, um, when the Fife family were living here and there was major renovations through Walter Brearley across the house and the garden. So here we are walking along the Rabinia border. Um, what I like most about this border is the early spring colours that we get along here. We get the, we get the early narcissus, we've got hellebores in flower, the snowdrops have just finished flowering. We've got some lovely bright pullman areas and, and these are where the early nectar sources for the insects and the, the emerging queen bees are going to be foraging to get that early nectar source. As soon as they've come out of hibernation, they need quick access to that nectar before they can go and start the colonies for the new year. One of my favourite plants along this border is the pulmonaria. It comes in bright blues and pinks, and it's a favourite of early bees. Even though it's very early in the year, we do have a few things in flower. Uh, the mahonia has been flowering for a few months. We have a few different varieties. The snowdrops have just gone over. It's been quite a short season, quite an early season for the snowdrops. The forsythia is in flower now. And one of my, one of my favourite plants is this Berberus darwinii really great orange um, flowering plant. Blossom is very important to us in the National Trust as it is to everybody and we're coming up to the blossom time of the year. People generally think of blossom, they're thinking about apple blossom and cherry blossom but I think of blossom as anything that grows in profusion, anything that flowers in profusion, particularly shrubs or trees and so I consider that the Forsythia and this Berberus Darwinii as to be our first blossoms of the year so we're really looking forward to that and when this opens up in a, in a couple of weeks time it'll be a bright orange coloured bush and the bees will be absolutely swarming all over it. My favourite area of the garden would have to be the meadow and orchard area. Um, what I like most about it is the diversity and the fact that we get several hits throughout the year of, of different interests and different experiences throughout the season. So not only in the spring where we get the, from the first daffodils then through to the cowslips and the camassias, through to the, the summer, um, early summer buttercups and several orchids growing through the garden through the orchards and the meadows and then eventually at the end of the year we cut the meadows down around about July, beginning of August and then the fruit become the star of the show. We, we opened a small part of the garden about 15 years ago called the Cutting Garden which is originally closed to the public. It's where we keep our composting system and cut flowers for the house and more recently we've been growing vegetables and herbs for, for the tea room. From opening this up about 15 years ago it's very quickly become one of the, the most used parts of the garden. It's a real hub of activity. Lots of people sitting up there and enjoying what is growing and asking a lot of questions. It's very popular now to grow herbs and, and vegetables at home and lots of people are trying it out for themselves and because we do it on a relatively small scale people can relate to it so we, we have a lot of people up there asking us questions about how they can do similar things in their house and in their own gardens and we can talk through how you can do it in a very small space even if you just got a one meter by one meter we can give people ideas how you can be very productive in a small space. We're, we're just entering the cutting garden now which is where we do our vegetable production and our composting. Um, very early in the season but I can see the rows of chives are starting to emerge we've got the rhubarb pots on top of the rhubarb and they're starting to force in fact one of them is just starting to 
to force the lid off now. And so for the next few months, we'll be taking lots of rhubarb stalks into the tea room here so they can use that in the kitchen. I can also see quite a lot of the, the cut flower beds like the daffodils are in full flower or just coming to full flower. And again, we'll be cutting them regularly to take them into the house. We like to decorate the house with as many flowers from the garden as possible to try and keep that um, echoing what's going on in the garden to echo that into the house. And another one of Mrs. Fife's favorite parts of the gardens is was this garden here, the Iris Garden, uh, dating back to the 1920s. It was removed um, 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 in, the, in the 1950s and it was put back in by the National Trust in the 1990s. It has become very tired, it's not very explorable. You can see the whole thing by walking past, which does mean people just generally walk past and they don't come in to really discover and explore this garden. So we are just going at the moment through a process with a design company to reimagine this space. We're gonna be removing some of the hedgerows around the side, um, removing some of the lawn, lifting the paving up, and we're gonna make this into a much more explorable, discoverable space with more seating and more diversity. There are constant challenges in having a garden open to the public. Um, one being um, having the amount of visitors. We're very successful and we get lots of people in, which is absolutely fantastic. However, at this time of the year, when it's been, as we all know, we've had such a wet winter and a, and a, and a wet, um, it's not even quite spring yet, but it continues to be very damp. We get a, a lot of impact on the, the paths and the grassways in the garden. So it's a real challenge to try and keep the high levels of presentation up with the high levels of visitor footfall. One of the key messages we try to get across uh, the gardens here at Nunnington Hall and across our portfolio is how we need to garden in a more resilient and sustainable way that we need to be looking at everything we do every the way that we live what we buy how we travel what we purchase and what particularly what we plant in the garden to encourage wildlife to encourage biodiversity and to look at sustainability every single thing we'll plant in the garden we're not only looking at how the visitors are going to enjoy that what experience it's going to bring but we're also looking at what that is going to do for biodiversity what wildlife benefits we can create from that, what habitats we can create, and what nectar sources, nesting stations, nesting places we can, we can deliver for, for the nature and wildlife that, that we encourage into our gardens. We're now walking through what we call the wildlife corridor. It was a bit of a dead end space leading into the cutting garden and we wanted to try and maximise the, the, the use in, in a small garden, we have to use every single square inch of it. So we put a bird feeding station in, and we put a, a, a habitat log wall with a turf top, we planted a, a native mixed hedge, uh, we built some uh, habitat piles and we put hedgehog boxes up, bird boxes all the way through. So it's a really great way to show people that even in a space which isn't uh, offers a lot of uh, opportunities for horticulture. There's still a lot of opportunity for the nature and the wildlife in your garden. Due to the fact that some of our wider countryside isn't serving nature as well as it could do, our gardens are becoming increasingly more important to do that. And if all of us are working together in our own private gardens, providing habitat, reducing the, the need for and use of chemicals, we can really make a difference to the declining bird populations, the declining insect populations, bats and small mammals. So if we all work together, we can, we can help that decline of nature and restore it back to where it should be. We're walking down what we call the avenue. It's a, it's a lime avenue. There's a set of lime trees set back among the shrubbery with the wonderful front south facade of the house in front of us. The long grasses at either side are grown as meadow grasses again. At the moment, the daffodils are just poking through um, and we manage the shrubberies for seasonal color. We have the Mahonia in, in flower at the moment. We have some lovely cornus mass that's just coming out. Viburnum tinus, the Viburnum bodnatensi with the exquisite smell has just finished flowering. And I can see the flowering current just to come out, just about to, to bloom as well. So even though it is a shrubbery, it is full of life. Uh, we have constant flowering throughout the year and, and a whole range of birds and insects visiting this part of the garden. What I like most about this garden and working for the National Trust is, is the diversity of the job. Every single day is different. We don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. We are open to the public on most days of the week and we meet a, a whole range of very interesting people. Um, not only the people that work here with us, the, the volunteers that work in the garden and the house, but also the visitors that come on a daily basis. Um, we constantly engage with our visitors and we learn so much from them and hopefully we're sharing experiences between each other. Thank you.